Morning, everyone. My name is Morning. Sharon Welch, and I will be your moderator for this class. I'd like to welcome you to another lecture given by the members of the Ithaca New York class. This is a school and not a church. Neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated in showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. The school is a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1958. We were incorporated, I'm sorry, 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year of 1958. <clears throat> the Ithaca branch was established in 1979. At this time, I'd like to recognize the Dean of the Ithaca branch, Dr. Robert White, and our host, Dr. Greg Prestis. Now in this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been erroneously substituted by Lord. The true title of the word of son is Elohim. It has been erroneously substituted by God. And the true name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted to read Jesus. <clears throat> now Lord and God are titles and not names. The apostle Paul filled with the Holy Spirit states in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and that there are God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a, is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that is the title that the creator chose for himself. Now, Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name, a minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by the letter J. Neither was there a letter J in our English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Making such names as Jesus and Jehovah and proper renderings of the true name of the Father and his Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Now, Yahweh is pure spirit, and in that state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have this cloud painted all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on the chart abides within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Now Yahweh, knowing that man cannot perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself, known as Yahweh Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine vision and understood in divine revelation. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world erroneously calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question we must ask ourselves is what was the name of the Messiah at the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of the name and title can be had by reading the preface of a Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by a divine pattern. It's called a divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai 
and he showed him this tabernacle pattern and a vision. He instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This tabernacle pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. We also go about in this school to show proof how that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of the threefold tabernacle pattern. And absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. <clears throat> Our school has 10 primary constitutional aims and objectives and they are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without the distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scripture, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensation and ages. Seventh is discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensation of time. <clears throat> Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered to the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with a hope of immortal glorification and the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. At this time, we'd like to have the class dedicated in prayer by Dr. Patricia Van Gaswick, and that'll be followed by a scripture, which is Exodus, the 14th chapter, and that'll be read by um, Dr. Wally, sorry, Donald O'Connell, <clears throat> and Dr. Keith Payne will be our backup scripture reader. Patricia, would you be able to do the prayer for us to, this morning? I, I think I would, Sharon. Thank you. Um, I've been a long time in class without speaking. I've told Gregory that when Yahweh wanted me to speak, he'd let me know. I'm not sure he agreed with me. I'm not sure today is the best day, but... Uh, I'll give it a try. It may be a little different than what you normally hear. I've been dealing with a lot lately, especially with my dear cat, Barney, who has been very sick and continues to be so. And I wonder in some way why he's still here. And I think that maybe Yahweh has left him here with me to teach me some kind of a lesson. I'm not sure what. I know that I'm thankful that he's still with me. And I know that when his time to go comes, uh, there will be nothing I can say or do to change that. Mm -hmm. And I think what I've come to is an acceptance, which leads me to the world situation. And I'm sure that many of you have watched as I have what is going on in Ukraine mm -hmm. and feel compassion, anger, sadness for those people and what they're going through. And yet I have come to believe that that is Yahweh's purpose, that this suffering that we sometimes dwell about here on the earth plane in the long run will really have no importance. I think 
I think there's lessons that we each can and do learn. I've, I've noticed through class that we each seem to do it in our own individual way, which I think is why Yahweh has brought us together. Mm -hmm. And part of me believes that there are many more people out there that perhaps feel the same as we do that do not know about class, or if they did know about it for whatever reason, would choose not to participate. But I have a feeling that uh, Yahweh's army is uh, a lot bigger than maybe you think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I pray for his guidance every day. I only, it's not really prayer in the sense I was raised a Methodist, a very good Methodist, I might say. But I married and uh, my husband was not religious or didn't have any desire to be. And for whatever reason, um, I chose not to make it a, a big part of my life sometimes not even a small part. And I, when I came to class, I realized that many of you had been together for years. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe I'm too old to pick up something new. And then I shortly realized that Yahweh had brought me to this class, brought me to Ithaca for his reasons. And so instead of praying for something or, or, or whatever, what I, what I end up doing is asking for guidance that I can come to an understanding of what he wants for me and what he expects of me. I think we all have different gifts that are bestowed on us. And I think it's up to each of us to discover what those gifts are and uh, use them to the best of our ability. And that, with that, I will conclude. Uh, I am glad to be here. I am glad to have met all of you. Mm -hmm. There are times I will talk. Maybe, you know, I'm really quite a talker when I get going, but, um, Today was a good day for it to happen. Good. And I'll be honest with you, I had a feeling it was going to. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm okay with that. And uh, may the peace and joy of Yahshua be with each of us today mm -hmm. and every day. I'm Hallelujah. Done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nice. Thank you very much, Patricia. You are welcome. Very inspiring. And uh, for our first speaker this evening, this morning, we will call on Dr. Sasha. Forgive me for not pronouncing your last name. How about a scripture? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> the scripture, Exodus 14, uh, Dr. Donald O'Connell, will you read that for us? Yes, I will. Thank you. And Yahweh spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Pihath Haroth between Migol and the sea over against Baal Zephon. Before it ye shall encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, that the Egyptians may know that I am Yahweh. And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And Yahweh hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. 
and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them encamping by the sea besides Pihath Hurath before Baal Saphon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto Yahweh. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone? that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear you not, stand still, and see the salvation of Yahweh, which he will show to you this day. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see them again no more forever. Yahweh shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward, but lift up thy rod, and stretch out thy hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all his host, and upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen, and the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh, when I have gotten the honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the angel of Yahweh, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And he came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and there was a cloud and darkness to them but gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Yahweh caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind. All that night it made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, Yahweh looked upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel. For Yahweh fights for them against the Egyptians. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Stretch out thy hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against, against it, and Yahweh overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned, and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, there remained, remained not so much as one of them. But the ch children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus Yahweh saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore, and Israel saw the great work which Yahweh did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared Yahweh and believed Yahweh and his servant Moses. It was Exodus 14. Thank you, Dr. Donald O'Connell. We'll have a three speaker format this evening. And for our first speaker, we'd like to hear from Dr. Sasha Rockmovich. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you can you hear me well? Yes. Good. Yeah. Um, I'm happy uh, 
to be uh, with you and uh, to share uh, the gospel of uh, Yahshua the Messiah. So as uh, the first uh, speaker or prayer slash speaker uh, was talking about the difficult times uh, in the world with war in Ukraine. And I know it's on the minds of uh, uh, many people. So I'll, I'll touch upon it. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I spoke about it in Oceanside last night, so I'm not going to repeat uh, this thing, but I'll, I'll talk about some uh, other things related uh, to this war. Uh, and before doing that, I would like to uh, send uh, best regards and uh, gratitude from the brethren in Crimea who are like in the midst uh, of these things. Uh, Crimea is a part of Russia, so it's not under the attack, but uh, the Russian troops kind of going through uh, Crimea to Odessa and other uh, Ukrainian cities. And these brethren who uh, are part of the uh, gospel of Yashu, they have relatives in Ukraine and I related uh, the uh, concerns and best regards from uh, some brethren like uh, Riba personally asked me to do it. And they they are very grateful and they told me that um, they feel uh, they felt much better when I related to them, you know, the support from us, from the brethren in, in the United States, because it's a, it's a very emotional uh, time, difficult time uh, for them, like for many other people, but especially people in Ukraine and in Russia. And uh, so they feel they feel comfort and they thank you for that. Now. In the scripture reading, so I will work a uh, little bit with the scripture reading in light of uh, what's happening in the world. So in the scripture reading, we uh, uh, read about um, Exodus of children of Israel out of Egypt. Uh, could you give me a, a Moses chart, please? So, and... Uh, uh, in a way, we are reading not uh, necessarily about the war, but about the uh, hostilities or about some uh, military action which uh, Pharaoh and his army are going to uh, impose on Israel because Israel are leaving Egypt or going uh, to the freedom from uh, uh, Egyptians bondage. And uh, uh, in fact, it uh, somewhat reflects what happened before with uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine. So uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, as, as you know, from the historical standpoint, they were very close uh, to Russia. Uh, in uh, early 900s, Kiev was the capital of uh, Russia and uh, Russian and Ukrainian people were just living side by side like uh, uh, brothers. And when it was the Soviet Union for 70 years, uh, Ukraine was the part of uh, Russia. But after the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union, so uh, Ukraine, it's somewhat like children of Israel live in Egypt. The Ukraine uh, left uh, Soviet Union and left, you know, this uh, bondage or communist bondage, which was the Soviet Union and became an uh, independent country, pro-Western country and uh, Russia and Soviet Union is the type of the uh, it's actually, it's called the old world. So it's a type of the old covenant, which is likened to bondage. And uh, uh, Ukraine, which was uh, liberated and wanted to be a part of the Western civilization, 
it would be like a type of the new covenant. So let me give you a, a little illustration so you will understand what I'm talking about because I, uh, uh, I lived in the uh, uh, Soviet uh, Union and I know uh, from the experience uh, what happened. So when I moved uh, from uh, Soviet Union to the United States, and I had to fill out uh, certain forms, you know, I don't remember what it was for, but you're filling out the form like in a bank or somewhere else. And I was filling out the form and I made the typo, I, I made a small mistake. So my first reaction was to take another form and to start, to start filling it out uh, all over again. And the American friends look at me and said, well, you're doing it just, you know, cross you know, the mistake right above it, you know, the uh, right, uh, correct writing and it will be it. Uh, for me, it was unheard of because back in Soviet Russia and in Russia after the Soviet Union, uh, it was, uh, you know, you made a mistake, you have to do it all over again. So it was a covenant by letter, not by spirit. And it was a lot of bureaucracy and it's uh, really type of, uh, uh, you know, the old uh, covenant thing. For me personally, going to the United States, which happened uh, 32 years ago uh, from Soviet Union, it was still Soviet Union back then, it would be likened to this Wizard of Oz movie when uh, uh, Dorothy uh, moved from this black and white world to this, this colorful fairy tale. So that's what it was, the United States for me, it's a really colorful fairy tale because you know, I can talk hours about my experiences about it, but it's just, a short illustration of what was happening. And now Ukraine is uh, uh, defending uh, its, uh, its uh, freedom. So before I go there, let me uh, just uh, give the, uh, the witness of what I'm saying that the old covenant is, the, uh, is a bondage likened to uh, Egypt and uh, the new uh, covenant, it's um, freedom. It's likened to children of Israel getting to the freedom to the uh, wilderness of Sinai and eventually to Canaan's land. Uh, let's read uh, just one verse. Let's read uh, Galatians 5 and uh, 1. Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse one. <clears throat> Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Yahshua hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Right. So that's what Paul uh, is saying uh, about the liberty of new covenant. And the old covenant is, uh, is the bondage. And that's what Pharaoh uh, wanted to do with the children of Israel who is leaving. He wanted to get them back to this yoke of bondage because the Egyptians, uh, it, it was a slavery. It was a, a bondage uh, in Egypt. And uh, another thing which I want to uh, talk about, somewhat focus on is um, uh, the Pharaoh and uh, Egyptians uh, with Pharaoh, Egyptians would be like uh, Pharaoh's um, host. You know, they uh, uh, deceived uh, in, a, in a figure, in a, in a symbolic sense, they deceived the whole world. Why? Because during this famine, which uh, uh, happened, the whole world, all nations, including uh, children of Israel, they had to come down to uh, Egypt to serve to Egypt. So they were uh, somewhat in, in uh, you know, conquering all world. And that's what uh, uh, 
ferro, uh, ferro uh, does. And ferro is the type of Satan. We read it in Ezekiel, where ferro is likened to the uh, red uh, dragon. So let's go to Revelation 12th chapter and start reading with verse 7. Revelation 12, 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against a dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard... Right. Thank you. So we are reading uh, in the end of the book, in the book of Revelation, that uh, it was the war in heaven, and it was the war. And, uh, you know, all, you know, all these wars, which was war in heaven, we're reading about uh, the de deliverance of children of Israel out of Egypt, the war of Russia and Ukraine, the all examples of the spiritual war which is happening right now. It's the war for the souls and minds of the people. So this is a spiritual invisible war, but to understand that we need, <clears throat> excuse me, we need to go uh, to the examples. Uh, so how did it uh, start? How uh, well, it's actually started in heaven. That's what we read, uh, uh, that uh, Satan deceived the whole, the whole world. But it's illustrated in a world, in a, a world uh, plane. So, and we can read about it in the first book. We are just moving uh, from the last book of, uh, uh, of the Bible to the first book of Bible, uh, the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 3. And let's uh, read verse, um, starting with verse one. Uh, Genesis three and one, please. Genesis three, verse one. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which Yahweh Elohim had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath Elohim said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may let, eat let, of the fruit. Okay. So, so I, I apologize. <clears throat> I will be uh, interrupting you because some thoughts are coming to my mind. So uh, when I came to this country, I was an atheist. I didn't believe in any God. And then people introduced me to uh, uh, different... Uh, churches to Protestant uh, churches, uh, Catholic church and uh, uh, synagogues and uh, so and I start reading the Bible and I'm telling you so when I came uh, to this country and I start reading the Bible, I thought that um, uh, you know the atheists, people who don't read the Bible, who don't believe in God, so they are deceived by uh, Satan. But the people who go to church, whether it's a Christian church or whether it's a, a Jewish synagogue, people who read the Bible. So these people, are, uh, they're not uh, under satanic influence. These are God-loving people. So, and when I start reading the Bible after coming, uh, to class, I mean, critically start reading the Bible and uh, uh, understanding the Bible by Yasha's grace, I should add. Then I realized that uh, Satan using the Bible, Satan is quoting the Bible. It wasn't, I couldn't imagine it when I, uh, you know, in the very beginning. And that's what we uh, uh, see here in Exodus, that he is reciting uh, with the slant, of course, the uh, words of uh, Yahweh Elohim. Why are you saying with the slant? Because 
that's not necessarily what Yahweh Elohim told to the woman. Yahweh Elohim told to the woman, look, there is a lot of the trees in the garden. They all good for food. You can freely, talking about the freedom, you can freely eat from any of them except this one. So Satan, when he, our serpent, who is Satan, when he is asking this question, just read, read uh, what Satan told uh, Eve again, please. Verse 2, and the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree. Verse, verse 1 again. Oh, I'm sorry. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which Yahweh Elohim hath made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath Elohim said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Look, look what's happening here. So Satan is focusing on the negative thing. He is, uh, he is not even mentioning about you can freely eat from any uh, fruit of the tree. You have abundance. Uh, it's, a, it's a grace of Yahweh. You know, you don't plant these trees. It's already there. All this food is provided. Just, uh, you know, eat of it. No, he is focusing on the negative thing. That's important to understand because that's the same tactic Satan is using right now for the people in the world and for us, trying, trying to put something negative. For example, you know, uh, look, you, you know, you, you can do freely all these things, but look what you are done yesterday, what you said yesterday, you offended somebody. So you see it's, uh, it's wrong and, and you think that you know, you're part of Yashua's body. So he's trying to cause doubt and cause negativity. Continue on in verse two. And now and the, the woman, the woman, sorry, uh, again. So the woman here, it's uh, represents the whole world. Yashua, uh, Adam is the type of Yashua because it says in the book, in Romans uh, fifth chapter, and First Corinthians 15 chapter, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it's talking about Adam being the a type or figure of Yahshua the Messiah. And uh, Eve came out of Adam like the creation came out of Yahweh Elohim. So Eve represents the creation or represents the humankind. Uh, so with this in mind, continue on in verse two. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now let me, uh, while I'm on this, we're talking about uh, satanic uh, uh, deception. So if you look in the, uh, what, if answered, and if you actually compared, I don't have time uh, to, uh, uh, to do it, but I'll, I'll just quote because you can read it in the first or oh, second, rather second chapter of uh, uh, Genesis. But the woman said, you, uh, the Elohim said, you cannot eat it and uh, you, can, you sh cannot touch it uh, unless you die. So what's happening? here is the woman who is a type of the people of the humankind. She is adding to the words of Yahweh Elohim and she is taken away from the word of Yahweh Elohim. Now, why actually we don't, we don't need to read it. Please find it in the second chapter what Yahweh Elohim actually uh, said. It's uh, verse 16 and 17. <clears throat> Genesis 2 verse 16 and Yahweh Elohim commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it 
for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So what Yahweh Elohim is saying in 17, he didn't say you shall not touch it. So she's adding. And you remember in the book, in the Deuteronomy, in the book of Revelation, uh, uh, it says don't add and don't uh, take away uh, from the book. Uh, uh, and that's what uh, Eve is doing. She's adding, you shall not touch, because it wasn't in the words of Elohim as we read it here. Plus, she said, because if you, if you do it, uh, 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 you shall die. But Yahweh, Elohim said, you shall surely die. In Hebrew, it's a repetition, you shall die a death. It's like emphasis of the importance of this thing. And uh, uh, Eve uh, took it away. And it's, uh, it's likened to this religious world because people uh, adding things to the Bible. You know, uh, Yash, for example, Yashua said uh, that he came to fulfill uh, the law and the prophets. And uh, the religious world saying, yes, and he also came to institute the Christian way of life. That's adding uh, to the Bible. And uh, also, uh, he, you know, uh, he is saying that uh, uh, he died to take away the sin of the people. And they take away this part of the Bible and uh, teach that, you know, if you're a believer, uh, whatever you do, as long as you live in this world, you continue to sin, just taking away the very important part of the mission of Yahshua, the Messiah. So she's kind of already prone to the deception. Uh, uh, you can see it from her answer. Continue on, please. In the third chapter of uh, third, Genesis. Yes. <clears throat> um, verse four, and the serpent said unto the women, Ye shall not surely die, for Yah, for Elohim knoweth that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good from evil. Right. And so, what, yeah, that's, uh, uh, thank you. So what's uh, uh, Satan saying, you know, you're not going to surely die. It's very pleasing to the ear. It's a gospel. It's a soothing uh, things. It's, uh, you know, you go and uh, it's a new age philosophy. You're not going to uh, surely die. And uh, so basically what he's saying that uh, Yahweh's intentions for the people are, uh, are bad. So he doesn't want them uh, to see the good things or to become like Elohim. But what will happen if they follow Satan, then they will eat from this uh, fruit of the tree and uh, they will become like Elohim. So he is like, a, uh, in a way, uh, uh, telling them it's going to be uh, good for you. I am going to give you uh, good things. And if you go with uh, Yahweh Elohim and do what uh, he says, that you will be uh, uh, deprived uh, of things. So he is positioning himself as a savior for the people. Now, that's what's happening in the world right now with uh, Russia and Ukraine. Putin, who is the type of uh, Satan, He's using the same tactic as the Satan does. He deceives the whole world. I don't mean the whole globe like uh, United States and the West, but the people who live in Russia, uh, they, for the, uh, for the majority of the people who follow the news, Russian news, they are deceived because it's been a propaganda for uh, 22 years. I know I talked to my brother last Sunday and he thinks that Putin is a savior. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
that uh, when I asked him about the war, he said, what kind of war? This is like a small um, mission, military mission to save uh, Russian and Ukrainian people from uh, Nazis, from fascists who took power in Ukraine and uh, having uh, uh, genocide. The Russian people and uh, some Ukrainian people. So this is a salvation operation by uh, Putin. That's what uh, you know. Uh, Putin is saying, actually, uh, he is because uh, the children are wondering what's going on in Russia right now. The government, uh, sanctioned by Putin, they sent uh, kind of uh, addition to the textbooks to the schools explaining the war in Russia. And that's what he pretty much explaining in the very simple terms for, uh, for the children that Ukrainian is bad, they fascist, and Russia is good, and Russia is trying to kill uh, fascists in uh, Ukraine like a Hitler, you know, like Zelensky is a Hitler, uh, Zelensky is a Ukrainian president. And we have to do it now, because if we don't do it now, then Ukraine will take more power and start attacking Russia. That's the propaganda which is happening right now for the minds of the small children, for the little children. And spiritually speaking so, that's exactly what the Roman Catholic Church and other churches are doing with the minds of, uh, of the children, yeah, meaning people who are spiritually young, spiritually not mature, they are listening to this propaganda and they're saying, oh, we are saved. Why we are saved? Because you were, I was baptized when I was, uh, when I was born by uh, uh, baptism of Catholic Church. And according to their doctrine, if you're baptized, uh, whether you're a child or whether you're an adult, you're saved. Don't worry about your salvation. You may do bad things in life, but you know, just go for confession, uh, confess your sins, which uh, Jesus is supposed to take out. They don't talk about it, but, uh, but you are fine. You're not going to surely die, as uh, Satan told to uh, Eve, deceiving the whole world, deceiving Eve. So she partook of this fruit and then she really died. And that's what's happening, unfortunately, with these people under this uh, religious deception, because without hearing the true gospel of Yahshua, the Messiah, you know, the soul is not going to resurrect, which in the time which I left, I want to go to the scripture reading and talk about it, because what we read in the scripture reading is talking about how the people are going to resurrect, how they're going to leave the bondage and uh, uh, deception or oppression of uh, Satan and how they can come uh, to the uh, freedom. So, and we know looking at the story with Exodus, they came to the freedom from, uh, by the blood, water and spirit. Blood, it was death of, of the lamb in Egypt, water, it's going through the Red Sea. That's what we read in the scripture reading. And then they're following the uh, angel cloud and the angel in the cloud. That's the spirit. But what's happening when they're crossing uh, the sea? Let's read Exodus 14 and uh, I think it's verse 16. Well, pick it up in uh, 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 what? Is it 14th chapter we're reading? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You want 13, Sasha? Let's read it from uh, starting at 13. Thank you. Okay. Exodus 14, verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh, which he will show you today for the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. 
uh, he said, stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh. And in Hebrew, this Yahweh, uh, Yahweh Yeshua, or abbreviated, it's Yashua. It's Yashua's name, meaning salvation of Yahweh. Uh, continue on. <clears throat> Verse 14. And Yahweh shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift up thou, uh, excuse me, but lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. So and there are five minutes, please. Dr. Sastra, five minutes. Yeah. Thank you. I'll try to jam it in uh, five minutes, but I think it's a beautiful uh, uh, manifestation and principle here. So what's happening here? How they come into the dry ground or from oppression to the freedom? Moses had to uh, lift this road and stretch his hand. So it's the figure of the stretched road. What does this road represent? What's the principle of the road? So I will need several scriptures. Proverbs 22, 15. Okay, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15. Bear with me just a moment. <clears throat> Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. So Solomon talking rod, uh, rod of correction, but what corrects uh, uh, people? Proverbs is the same book in the Bible, uh, chapter 29, verse 19. <clears throat> 29, verse 19. A servant will not be correct by words, for through, for though he understand, he will not answer. Right. So the words are going to correct. So the correction is coming, you know, from the words. And the Apostle Paul is uh, understanding this thing, and he writes in Second Timothy three sixteen. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of Elohim and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Right. That the man. So, continue on. Mm -hmm. That the man of Elohim may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Right. So rod is the symbol of correction or the symbol of the teaching or the gospel. So the stretched rod is the uh, is a symbol, it's allegory of the gospel being preached, of the gospel of death, burial, and resurrection. And through this preaching of this gospel, we are crossing. Red Sea, or uh, go uh, go to the uh, freedom. Uh, please read Exodus 4, uh, starting with verse 1. Well, actually, because of the because the time of short, I'll remind the story that uh, 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 Yahweh, when uh, Yahweh asked Moses to go to Egypt to deliver the children of Israel, and uh, Moses saying, "Who am I?" Yahweh is giving him a witness. He is saying, take the rod and uh, throw it to the ground. And he threw it to the ground and the rod became a snake, a serpent. And then Yahweh Elohim said, take this uh, rod by the uh, tail or take the snake by the tail. And he took it by this uh, tail and uh, lifted it up and it became uh, a serpent. A, a rod again. So what's the principle? We already know that the rod, it means the gospel. It's teaching of Yahshua, the Messiah. So when you put it on the ground, 
or when you give it a carnal inter interpretation, that's what people in the world do. So it becomes a serpent or it becomes a satanic lie. So you cannot recognize this straight doctrine anymore. And what needs to be done to uh, make it again uh, useful or ready for salvation or to become a rod? You have to lift it up or you to have to uh, 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 take it uh, symbolically show the spiritual uh, significance of it or take it from the ground or uh, to take away this carnal uh, interpretation of this. And to finish up, so what's going on uh, in uh, Ukraine, it's uh, affected many people in the world and many people in the world are eager to help Ukraine, but whatever they can, they pray for the people in Ukraine because Ukraine is symbolizing the new covenant. It's symbolizing our freedom from oppression, freedom from satanic lies, from satanic deception. So they try to donate money. You know, they send in uh, weapons, you know, from uh, the Western country and the weapons of uh, our warfare are not carnal. So it's the law and the prophets are weapons. And uh, so this is our mindset in this school because we want the Ukraine to be free. We want people in the world who are deceived by the print of this world, you know, to be uh, free. And what we, you know, this uh, uh, response of the people in the world to Ukraine, we can see it reflected in us in this school because we he have this passion for preaching the true gospel and for the true uh, liberation, spiritual liberation, because Ukrainian will be uh, liberated. I have no doubt about it, but it's temporary because it's physical, but we are mm -hmm. talking about spiritual liberation, which is eternal. And that's what our passion is. And that's what our true fight is. Thank you and praise be to Yasha. Hallelujah. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, and at this time, our next speaker will be the Jane of Rhode Island, Dr. Susie Sikowski. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? <laughs> I have a yes. plane going over at the moment. Sorry. Yes, we can hear um, you. <clears throat> can we? Well, let me start off by mentioning something. Um, it, things catch your eye and your ear and your mind as you go through the week and so i was reading the recent national geographic magazine and there's a column in the beginning and the title at the top of the page said who gets to tell the story matters and so that got me thinking about what we read what we see what we hear and um in follow-up to what sasha was talking about we have an amazing manifestation going on in the world today about how a story gets told and what people are able to see and hear related to that. Um, the way that the, the information is being handled in Russia is what we would call censorship or just outright blocking what the actual facts and truth of a matter are. Um, in the discussion about the truth that's going on, it's being called fake news. Yep. So it's interesting that we're, we're seeing firsthand so clearly that in a lot of cases, truth is called fake news or called a lie. And as Sasha was talking about, everything that we're looking at is a manifestation in the natural sense, trying to show us something about the spiritual principle behind that in the functioning of Yahweh's purpose and plan. And our goal with what we learn in these classes, what we share with one another, 
and what we hope to to meditate on and consider and have revealed unto us is what does something show us in the spiritual reality of things because the natural is temporary that's been mentioned and it is going to pass away um everything has an expiration date including ourselves and what we care about is life after this natural creation and this natural existence that we're in so that we can truly come to an understanding um let's get john 17 3 for a moment to read that and if somebody if the other scripture reader would get psalms 19 john 17 3 and this is life eternal that they might know thee the only true Yahweh and Yahshua the Messiah who now has sent. All right, now this is the Messiah. The world knows him as Jesus. We understand that the correct name for the Messiah is Yahshua, which means Yahweh is salvation. And Sasha was just pointing out back in Exodus 14, how when they were told to stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh, they were essentially being told to stand still and see Yahshua or Yahweh's salvation to help them leave Egypt and go through the Red Sea. And so the Messiah in his ministry in John 17 is picking up the, um, the message that, um, and reread that please. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true Yahweh and Yahshua the Messiah whom thou hast sent. All right, and this is life eternal. This is spiritual salvation. This is um, what it means to be in the kingdom of heaven. I'm trying to use different phrases that people in the world are familiar with. This is what it means to be saved. And we saw the manifestation of that back with Israel at the Red Sea in Exodus 14. But this is the reality of that. This is life eternal to know Yahweh and Yahshua, the Messiah. And it should be pretty incredible if you think about what that means, that it's not saying that you have to wait till after you die and stand at some gates and wait to be let into heaven. It, makes you think of a sporting event where everybody's standing in line and trying to get into somewhere as the world has kind of created this picture in our minds. You can have life eternal now if you have knowledge of Yahweh and Yahshua. You are already have a foot in the kingdom of heaven or in life eternal. Now, your question should be, how do I get that knowledge? Because clearly what's being offered in the world today is not providing that to people. They do not feel that they've been saved. They don't feel that they have an understanding. In a lot of cases, they're patiently waiting because they've been told they can't understand things until after they die. But that's an awful risky chance to take if they're wrong, because you, by the time you find out that that's not the way it is, it's all over and it's too late. So our hope is that you'll consider what Yahweh has allowed us to, to understand and to share with everybody so that you can participate in life eternal now. Now, um, let's go to Psalms 19. Psalms 19. What verse did you want to pick it up at? Right at one, please. Okay. The heavens declare the glory of Yahweh, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Okay, their thank line, you. Let's, okay. Oh, uh, sorry, finish that verse up, Keith. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. All right, in them so, has he set a tabernacle for the sun. This is back in what's called the prophets or the prophets and the Psalms in the Old Testament of the Bible. And it's talking about Yahweh revealing or communicating or expressing 
what he wants us to see and know through the creation. And I didn't see this. I had never been shown this verse or this concept, this principle before I had come into this teaching. But what it says is that there's nowhere, no country, no people, no language, no set of eyes, no set of ears, where you can't see something about your creator and about what he's doing in this creation. Keith, would you start reading that again at one? Sure. The heavens declare the glory of Elohim, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. Okay, so the there firmament, the heavens, the day, the night, they're all talking to us. They're all giving us knowledge about our creator. And that knowledge in, um, let's go to Romans 1, 19 and 20, trying to pick up to show you how you can understand and how the things written in the Bible that you may or may not have ever been shown, how you can understand the mind of your creator and therefore understand the things that are going on around us in our own lives or in the world. Wherever we look, we can see something that reveals our creator to us. Now, Romans, this is written by Paul, what we're gonna be reading. We're in the first chapter of Romans. We're gonna start at 19. And Paul is telling the people in the class at Rome something very important about how you learn about Yahweh. Read. Romans 119, because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them, for Yahweh hath showed it unto them. All right, I'm going to interrupt you here, because that which may be known about Yahweh. Now, the starting point that you should take away from that phrase is that you can know something about your creator. You may not be able to know everything but you can know something about your creator because that which may be known about Yahweh, read. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. All right, so the invisible things about Yahweh <clears throat> from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now, normally you wouldn't be able to think you could see invisible things because the two are opposite seeing and invisible means you can't see but this is telling you that you can see invisible things about your creator and you find out that Yahweh is spirit and that there's divine attributes and he exists in a realm that we can't see or perceive with our natural senses touch taste sight scent you can't understand or see or perceive Yahweh with your natural senses. He is invisible in that sense, but he has made a way for us to be able to understand him. And how is that? You can perceive invisible things by? Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. So you can see invisible things because they're understood by the things that are made. Now understand implies the, the use of your mind. Doesn't take your physical eyes, your physical ears, but you can understand invisible things about your creator by the things that are made. So that as we look around, as we look heavens, firmament, day into day, night unto night, as we read in Psalms, all those things are how your creator has put information out there for you to understand about him, even so that you can understand his supernal nature or what some of the world might call the Godhead and his, um, I'm sorry, finish that out, supernal nature and... Um, let's see. Um... I'll pick it up at 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. All right, even his eternal power and Godhead or supernal nature, so that 
there's no excuse for not understanding them. So we ask ourselves and we try to stay alert and, and look around and have the things that catch our, our um, thinking or our um, eyesight or our hearing during the day, like that the topic, the title of that article set, you know, caught my interest and ask Yahweh, what do you want me to see? What are you showing me? So if we go back to that title that I started out with, who gets to tell the story matters. What we're looking to do is to find out who's telling the truth and who's not telling the truth to be able to discern um, a lie or a deception. And if we go into, um, let's see, let's go back. Um, Sasha got Second Timothy three, and I'd like to pick it up at the beginning of that chapter. So starting at verse one. Three and one. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of Yahweh. All right, so um, while we stop for a moment. So this scripture, when all of this started in the Ukraine, this scripture came to mind and it starts out by saying this know also that in the last days perilous time shall come and what we normally think of when we think of perilous times could be warfare with tanks and guns and bombs and and um all the things that we're seeing happen and manifest in the ukraine these days it could be um, natural disasters because of the weather. It could be plagues. Um, there's no end of what falls under our definition of perilous as to how it might negatively impact us or threaten us. But what what's being said here is that that's just a natural manifestation of the things that we really need to be worried about. And what Timothy is defining as perilous is what's in the next few verses. Reread that again for me, starting at two. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of Yahweh. All right. And you've seen all of these attributes or characteristics manifest in the current events, whether it be with the way, the, um, the way Putin has handled all of the things that have been going on, or other types of people that are looked up to or in a, a leadership or um, a, a public view as to how they conduct their lives, their decisions, their worlds, um, how they interact with other people. You may even see it on a one-to-one -one in the world around you and family, work, um, whatever. But you see these characteristics and these are manifestations of what's in a man, what's in their soul, in their heart, and in their mind. And these are the things that are perilous in this time. We should worry less about, um, about being shot or getting sick with the um, current virus that's going around or any of those other things from a natural standpoint that can be truly scary in our world and worry more about this kind of characteristic, this kind of um, nature that we're trying very hard to make sure that's not what manifests through our heart and in our mind. That that's, this is the mystery of iniquity as has been mentioned. And this is how he functions in this world. 
and how these are the signs and the witnesses and the way that you can discern that which is within a person. And the people like Putin um, and some other of the world leaders that are um, dictators and, and um, bullies and all of that are manifestations of how the mystery of iniquity functions from a natural standpoint, which really shows what's going on within them from a spiritual and psychological standpoint. Their nature and their job is to lie and to deceive and to um, want to try and steal and murder the souls of people. And that's clearly what we're trying to fight against in the spiritual warfare that we're involved in. Now, um, let's get Second Peter, the first chapter, and I'd like to start um, down a little bit earlier than we usually do. I'm going to join you here. I think it's around 15 or 16. Um, 16. 16, please. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Okay, so Peter's talking to the class, to a group of people that he's teaching and preaching to, and, and um, he's saying, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. we need to be very careful about the information, the knowledge that we listen to and accept. It all should be, um, I would use the phrase checked out. We wanna have witnesses. We wanna have discernment. We wanna have um, a vetting of, of information so that we can be comfortable that we are not following cunningly devised fables. And we have to be careful of that because these fables are everywhere. Putin ha has a whole system set up of cunningly devised fables that he has told the Russian people so that they're not even aware, or if they are aware, they believe there's some special military project going on and they're not allowed to see or hear the true devastation and the true activity that's going on in the Ukraine. That's a manifestation of what's happening in the spiritual world, that of religion, philosophy, economics, politics. There's so much in the way of cunningly devised fables that and in the natural world, sure, it can be harmful or destructive or um, problematic to us. But again, we care about what is being done that can affect our souls, the life, the life of our souls. So we want to check out that we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Keep reading. Cunningly devised fables where we made known unto you the power and coming of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. But were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from Yahweh the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. All right, so Peter's talking about being eyewitnesses. Now, you know, when you go to court, an eyewitness holds a lot of credibility relative to a testimony that they give. So he's saying, we've not followed cunningly devised fables because we were eyewitnesses of the majesty and of what happened with Yahshua the Messiah. Read. In this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first and no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, 
the holy men of Yahweh spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. All right. Now, those last couple of verses um, Sasha had pulled and takes me back to, again, the headline of that, that column that I was looking at, who gets to tell the story matters. If you think about what they say about history, they say that the winners write history, that those who are in power, those who um, are uh, considered, quote, the winners in a situation or over a period of time or over a battle or um, those are the ones that write history. And so that um, we have to be very cautious and we have learned that everything that's written in history books, it may have a slant, may have a spin put on it that may not be the full story or the story at all. And so from our standpoint, looking for spiritual life, for eternal life, we want to have not cunningly devised fables, but we want to have a more sure word and knowing that the prophecy of the scripture is not of any private interpretation, but came in um, as Yahweh spoke through holy men and expressed those men expressed the words of Yahweh that were given to him. That's what we want to be sure we're following. So we have to paraphrase, um, we have the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. We don't want anybody's opinions, theories and concepts mixed into things, which is why in this school, we, have, we will show witnesses out of the scriptures, out of the creation, um, out of current events and historic events. We want people to feel that they have been given something that they can have confidence in and have um, knowledge in and um, a strong foundation in, and that it isn't fables, but it is the truth that comes forth from our creator. Now, if we go into, again, thinking about the whole truth, that's what they talk about when you're in court and you have witnesses. If you go back into Deuteronomy 19, I think it's 19 around 15 with the witnesses. Um, yep, 15. All right, um, let me just double check. I think it's what I want is to start at 15 and continue down a little bit. So this is our judicial system these days has its roots in what's set up back in the Old Testament in the Bible with the judges and the, and the testimonies and the need for witnesses and things. So in Deuteronomy 19, Wally, if you would start at 15, and I want you to read down to 18, please. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. All right, so this is a very important principle. Back in the law, when they were setting up judgments and the kind of the legal system, but in principle, if we take this as a manifestation and the principles, what's important, you want not just one witness, but you want at the mouth of two or three or more witnesses for a matter to be established that relates to your spiritual welfare and your spiritual eternal life. Read. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before Yahweh, before the priest and the judges, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall you do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shall thou put the evil away from among you. All right. And so let's go back the beginning of 18 and the judges shall make diligent inquisition. Yep. So that should be our approach to anything anybody shares with us about these are the words of the creator. This is what you need to believe. This is what will provide salvation, whatever. Going back to Sasha's discussion about what happened in the Garden of Eden with between the serpent and, and Eve and the discussion about what has Yahweh said and no, oh, that's not what he really meant. Our, our, um, our job, I guess, to use a phrase, our um, sincere efforts 
should be to make a diligent inquisition on those things that we've been given, both that we try to listen to and consider, and those things that we offer to others, so that we can be sure that we are offering truth and not fake news, not things that are our own opinions or take on something, but that are the truth of Yahweh that can lead to that eternal life, the knowledge that we talked about in John 17. And I think I'll leave it at there. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Dr. Sikowski. And for our next speaker this morning, we will call on the president of the Oceanside, California class, Dr. Carl Emler. Uh, good day. Good day. <laughs> hey, Carl. Since our times are all different, um, um, I want to continue in the vein uh, that both Sasha and Susie worked with, and that is uh, this idea of truth versus lie and how it is um, misunderstood and mistaught uh, in most of the uh, religious philosophies uh, in the world. And um, uh, let me just do something here real quick. Uh, I want to go to Proverbs, um, the 16th chapter. Let me get there to see if I need to pick it up. Um, geez. Um, that's an 858. That's a, I'll get it. Hold on for a second. Hello? Hello? I'm sorry, it was a hospital call. I wanted to get it for Diane. Um, uh, let's go to 16 and one on Proverbs. And um, what we're talking about is the mystery of iniquity that um, we uh, read about in all of the various religious um, treatises that are produced. That means the Bible, either if it's the Old Testament, the, uh, the Torah, et cetera, that the Hebrew Jewish people use, or the what we call in Christianity, the complete Bible, which is the Old Testament and uh, the New Testament, talking about Jesus or Yahshua, or whether it's um, uh, uh, the Quran uh, or any of the, even the Eastern religions, there's always uh, a, a discussion about or a representation about a, uh, a mystery of iniquity or a negative mystery or a negative principle and the mystery of righteousness or a righteous principle. And in the scriptures, we have that. Now in Proverbs 16, uh, and, and of course, Susie was talking about that as far as trying to determine whether even something you read in the news is accurate or if it's twisted because it's been uh, put together and published by someone who, I'll use the term, has an ax to grind or has a, a personal preference that they're trying to portray rather than giving uh, the whole truth and nothing but the truth as you know, uh, we, we recite when we're in court or something and you put your hand on the Bible and give us the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. And uh, we generally don't do that really, but uh, that is the only way uh, these witnesses that Susie alluded to, in other words, 
You need to confirm information. You need to confirm the concepts that you have. And you need to do these confirmations in, the, in your everyday life. You know, if you take your car someplace and you hear a noise and you don't know anything about mechanics and they say, oh, you need this fixed and that fixed and the other thing fixed. And you don't know what they're talking about. It may not even seem reasonable. You get a second opinion. If you have a medical issue, you are, in, you know, you're encouraged to get a second opinion, even though sometimes even in the medical field, you know, a doctor may be offended if you say you want to have a second opinion because you're challenging his or her uh, evaluation. And, you know, there's one way to challenge it with an attitude, but there's another way to challenge it just to be sure that what's going on is right. And um, those considerations should be reasonable and we should be allowed to get witnesses and proof for anything both physically, your car or your health, or spiritually, is what someone's telling you about God actually true? So uh, with that bit of uh, uh, preparation, start at 16, please. One. 16, one. Go ahead, Keith. Go ahead, Wally. Okay. Um, the preparations of the heart in man and the answers of the tongue is from Yahweh. So now it, we're, we're talking here about the preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue. And as far as this uh, uh, Bible is concerned, or at least in this particular aspect, these Proverbs and this really, these concepts you'll find all the way through the Bible. We can't go and get all the various different scriptures, but I want you to know that the concepts or the ideas that are portrayed as we try to understand what's written in the Bible are confirmed in many places. But, uh, uh, and I think Susie got one over there in the, the, what you call the New Testament, where in the mouth of two or three witnesses is, is oh, that was in uh, mm -hmm. Exodus, the mouth of two or three witnesses is a matter established. And the same thing is here, because back in Exodus, of course, it was Yahweh who brought the children of Israel up out of Egypt. It was Yahweh who, and this chart that you see in front of you depicts that Exodus of Israel coming up out of Egypt, which is at the bottom of this chart, into the wilderness of Sinai, which is where that little tabernacle is with the tents around it. And then uh, Moses is up at the top of the mountain and that's where Moses received a vision, etc. And that's where Moses received the law, the instruction of Yahweh and Moses received the commandment that in the mouth of two or three witnesses should a matter be established. And Susie was right to say that even our current day judicial system has picked up and used these very principles that were shown to Moses in a vision at the top of Mount Sinai, as far as your Bible is concerned. In other words, this wasn't something that was carried down uh, through ages by people telling stories and repeating it and writing it down here and writing it down there. That's not how the information of Genesis with Adam and all the rest of the stuff came about being. Some uh, religious Christian doctrines say that all of these genealogies and the things that happened in Genesis were carried down by man and, you know, and, and, and then finally written down by Moses. But if you go all the way back to the Genesis 1-1 where the earth was created, uh, you'll find there was no man there to carry that down. Who told anybody about that? And you're going to read, if you read in Exodus, that Moses was called to the top of the mountain and was given a vision. He was shown a tabernacle. He was shown the six days of creation. Moses saw all this stuff in a vision, and he wrote it down in what you call the Old Testament, which is why your books of the Old Testament, the first five books, is called the first book of Moses called Genesis because Moses saw it in a vision. The second book of Moses called Exodus, because Moses saw the exodus of the children of Israel in a vision as well. Uh, uh, Deuteronomy is the third book of Moses, etc. So Moses had all this information given to him or transmitted to him directly 
by the spirit of God or the spirit of Yahweh. And that's hard to comprehend because we don't necessarily experience that in our current lives. When we go to church, we don't have the experience that God or Yahweh is directly talking to them. They have a man uh, on, a, on the podium who has gone to seminary school and uh, uh, preached all the, or learned all these things, and then is telling you what they learned in seminary school, which are uh, interpretations of what people who have studied uh, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Prophets, etc. now they study it, and then they interpret it, and then they present it to you, which is why you have one kind of presentation from Roman Catholics, one kind of presentation from Lutherans, one kind of presentation from Methodists, one kind of presentation from uh, the <coughs> rabbinical teachings. You have one kind of presentation of the Old Testament by Islam because they take their lineage all the way back to Ab Abraham. And you have all of these religions out in the world with various interpretations uh, of what they read in the Bible. And because you have these different <coughs> interpretations, you wind up with a chaotic uh, concept of God. He's either this or he's that. He's a trinity. He's a duality. His name is this. His name is that. It's Yahweh. It's Jehovah. Uh, you do need to do this. You drink the, the wafer and uh, wine and Catholicism. It's the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. But if you drink it in a, as a Methodist, it's only a uh, a, a type and a shadow only represents that. And people don't have a way to evaluate what they're being told is true. And the chaos we have in current religions is reflected in the chaos we have in the world. Because if any nation was under the God of uh, that is really exists, that nation would not be in chaos. And so we have printed on our money in God we trust, but even the United States is in chaos. There's 50% of the United States voting population who believes in dem dem the Democratic Party and 50% who believes in the Republican Party. And so they're fighting against each other over these concepts and they're not looking for any kind of universal or any kind of common uh, uh, understanding. And the only universal or common understanding it's going to turn out is something that is actually true. The truth will stand. That's what I want to get to in 16. And I'm, I know I'm, I'm rushing here, but I've got a short period of time and I just want to bring these things out. What I want to do is make people aware that when we talk about God in this school, because this is a school, we hope and struggle and try to go into the textbook, which is the Bible and in to the textbook, which is the creation. Remember, Susie read in Psalms 19th division, the heavens declare the glory of Yahweh. The firmament shows that's the creation. The heavens is day unto day, it utters speech. Night unto night, it shows knowledge. So the creation is saying one thing, but people's interpretation of it may be saying something totally different. Paul picks up in what you call the New Testament exactly the same thing. And he talks in Romans 1, 19 and 20 about how the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen. So you can see invisible things. And I'm just reiterating and bringing these things back to your remembrance what the previous speakers have said. You can see these invisible things because the things that are made reflect them. So much so that you can understand his eternal nature and his uh, his super, his power and his uh, and his uh, the nature uh, or the Godhead and you are without an excuse. Why? Because everybody sees a sunrise and everybody sees a sunset and everybody sees the oceans versus the land and the fish versus the we see the natural creation, but we don't necessarily get a spiritual interpretation of from the world. What we get is, oh, look how pretty it is. God must be nice. Instead, these aspects of the creation are showing forth something about our invisible God or something that you can't see. Uh, and in John 
uh, uh, John talks about how that no man has seen God or no man has seen Yahweh at any time, confirming Paul when Paul says it's invisible. So uh, there's got to be a way in the way that Yahweh has provided for us to see it is he's given us these scriptures that show forth proof or uh, of an invisible presence and the creation which shows forth proof of invisible presence. Uh, 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 presence of God or Yahweh. Now, in 16, it says the preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from Yahweh. It's not from your politicians. And it's not from your religious leaders if your religious leaders aren't informed about Yahweh. Your religious leaders may be informed about Methodists or Lutherans, Lutheranism or Catholicism or Islam or Judaism, but is that interpretation from Yahweh? And that's what this school is set up is to try to help you to understand that. Uh, so uh, Yahweh is doing the preparation here and I got to start cutting down because I'm killing the time with this long explanation. Uh, uh, go to nine, 16 and nine. Yes. Um... 16 and 9. And a, man, a man's heart deviseth his way, but Yahweh directeth his steps. So a man's heart devises his, his way. In other words, we think that this is how it is, but it's Yahweh who directs you. And sometimes you may think one thing and wind up doing the other. And Yahweh directs you. Now, this is the, uh, uh, let's see, where are we? 16 and 9. Um, Oh gosh, I'm trying to think of where I wanted to go exactly in Proverbs. Maybe, it, did I miss it already? Right, six. six. Yeah, six is what I wanted. Thank you, Wally. Okay. I, um, go ahead, read six. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by fear of Yahweh, men depart from evil. So by mis mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And we're, we've been talking about the mystery of iniquity. Uh, one of our aims is about the, the not to be de deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, or dragon, and his demons. And these are all things that the world has put in our minds to be a big red guy with a pitchfork or, you know, this fiery uh, serpents and all the movies you see depict these various concepts of iniquity as these monsters and everything else. When in fact, the mystery of iniquity is a subtle uh, uh, influence of deception and the deception is made to look good to you because if it didn't look good to you, you wouldn't be deceived. If you were faced by a big old bad red guy with a pitchfork and a tail, there's no way you're gonna think, oh, maybe that's God. But if you're uh, presented by a man in robes and, and he's tall talking quiet and everything and trying to give you some information about God, but the information is wrong, see, then you could be deceived. We're going to be deceived by people who look like us and think like us and talk like us because that's who we listen to when in fact we need to be objective uh, 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 listeners to the witnesses. And so by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of Yahweh, men depart from evil. Well, in order to fear Yahweh or to fear the Lord, you got to know him. You have to know something about him in, in order to have this fear, which is a respect, a reverence, not a, I'm scared you're going to kill me fear. It's a respect or a reverence. So uh, by uh, mercy and truth is iniquity purged, and by the fear of Yahweh, men depart from evil. So I said all that because I want you to understand, when we're talking about the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of righteousness, we are talking about two invisible influences, I'll say it like that, so that you understand that here you are, a person walking in this creation, and you're challenged by things that you hear and see, and you are influenced one way or another. And there's an influence that is based on deception. And there is an influence that is based on truth. And if you can get the truth and understand the truth, 
um, uh, uh, that will cause you to walk in a way that will give you comfort because you will not be deceived. Things will, will happen as they should. So now that brings us to what's going on in the Ukraine, as far as the, uh, uh, um, Putin is telling his people one thing, and we're seeing actual videos of something else. You don't even have to turn on the sound. All you have to do is watch the bombs dropping. All you have to do is see the civilians being killed. But Russia is not getting, the Russian people are not getting that information, which is what Sasha, who is Russian, who has a brother still in Moscow, who is not necessarily an elite uh, of uh, Russia with all kinds of ability to get outside information, et cetera, and is only subject to what has been told to him. He therefore has only that to believe. He only has one witness and he's only provided by one witness. And Putin is very careful by getting rid of all of the, in, inter, uh, the, the other news organizations that are independent. He shut them down so that you can't get the second witness or the third witness. Now, we see the result of that in uh, the physical world, which justifies physical killing of physical people. These people who are being bombed, civilians, children, and everything else, uh, Putin is justifying in the killing of them by ignoring that that's what's really happening. All right, now, here's where the, the twist comes in. As far as your soul is concerned, as far as the spirit of Yahweh in you is concerned, that there is a contention for that part of you that is spiritual or that is your soul. And that contention is between the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of righteousness. And that's how they're expressed in the Bible. Uh, uh, great is the mystery of righteousness. It's over there in the, uh, in the New Testament. I don't have time to get all these scriptures because I'll run out of time in making this point, but I'm going to tell you that these scriptures are in there and you can search mysteries <coughs> importance and you can find these scriptures. But great is the mystery of, of uh, godliness. It says over in... Um, I think it's 2 Timothy. If someone knows where it is, just tell, just shout out where that scripture is because I need help with these scriptures so people have that information. But it talks about greatest mystery of holiness or godliness. Uh, uh, so someone... Uh, what is it, Sasha? 1 Timothy 3.16. Okay, so 1 Timothy 3.16 talks about great is the mystery of godliness. Now, there's another place where it says the mystery of iniquity does already work. And that's, I think, in the ninth chapter of Hebrews, maybe. Um, second Thessalonians, second chapter. What is it, Suess? Second Thessalonians, second chapter. <laughs> I wasn't even close. Second Thessalonians, the second chapter, the mystery of iniquity is mentioned. So these are two mysteries. And a mystery, by definition, is something that you don't know and you have to figure you're out or you have to learn about. And so there is a mystery of righteousness and there is a mystery of iniquity that permeates these creations, uh, both the angelic creation, which you read about the, that Satan was cast out, if you will, from uh, heaven and the physical creation where Eve is supposedly encounters the mystery of iniquity in the Garden of Eden. And then you find out the mystery of iniquity is manifest in Pharaoh down here in Egypt. And the mystery of iniquity is manifest in many of the kings of Israel and in, in the prophets. So there are these two mysteries and it behooves you to try to understand something about him. And what we do know is that in order to understand something about the mystery of truth or the mystery of righteousness, you have to have more than one witness. It has to become uh, in the mouth of two or three witnesses is a thing established. Now, get me over in John. Uh, I think it's the third or the fifth chapter where the Messiah confronts the Pharisees. Uh, 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 I think it's the fifth chapter where he confronts the Pharisees and says uh, uh, to the law and the prophets, you think <coughs> you have eternal life, but they are they which testify me. John 539. Please read it. Susie, if you, or anyone who has it. I don't have it in front of me. Right. Search, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So here's the Messiah talking to the, the rabbinical 
priests back there, just as you would be talking to your minister or your priest or your rabbi, you would want to have to the, the truth known. And so he's challenging them after all these years coming down from the, uh, the law given to Moses in Mount Sinai, 1500 years earlier, that the rabbis, the ministers of Israel were teaching the people erroneous things and about the law and the prophets of the Old Testament. And he says, you, you ministers, you rabbis, you search the scriptures and you think this, you think that they are, that they're testifying of you, but they're testifying of me. Read it again, Don. Search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are which they are they which are testifying of me. They think when they search the scriptures that it's righteous, that they have eternal life. And, the, and, and Yahshua, or Jesus is saying, no, that's not what's going on. The law and the prophets are the scriptures that you're searching to think it's about you and your eternal life. They testify about me. Now read on, Wally. And you will not come to me that you might have life. Now you won't come to me. You go to the scriptures, you interpret the scriptures, and you think it's all about you, and you should do this, and you should do that, but you won't come to me that you might have eternal life. Read. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that you have not the love of Yahweh in you. So he says to this, to the leaders of Israel back then, he says, uh, I know you that you do not have the love of Yahweh in you, that you seek honor of men, that you want to be worshipped as something, that you want to be respected by other people, that it's all about you. And you're going to find out that Putin is a good example of that. Uh, you know, we've had other politicians in this country, most of them almost are a good example of that. They want their theory and idea uh, uh, um, adhered to, and they bully you to believe them, and they hide truth from you, witnesses. And so when we go into history or when we go into the things that are said by these politicians, even in this country, and then there's the quote, open mic information where uh, one of the politicians doesn't know the mic is on him and he says what he really thinks. And then you're astonished. Oh, you didn't say that. You said this thing. And so we, we know we're being deceived by the politicians in this country and in the rest of the world because they want to be praised. They want to be a big shot. They want to be the big man on campus, you understand. And Yahshua says to these, these people who search for that attitude, he said that uh, uh, these scriptures testify of me, but you won't come to me because you want honor of men. Uh, Reread that uh, part again, Don. Verse, verse 40. And you will not come to me that you might have life. I receive not honor from men. But I know you, that you have not the love of Yahweh in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. So he says, now I come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. And another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. So here's Yahshua. That's why this name is so important. This name Yahshua and Yahweh is so important. Because you can't know what that means unless you know the father's name is Yahweh. And you can't know that he came in his father's name unless you know his name is Yahshua because Yahweh and Yahshua, they're coming in the same name. You understand And you can't know this particular situation has any relevance to an understanding unless you first know those names. But people say, well, it doesn't matter to me whether you call him Yahshua or Jesus whether you call him Yahweh or Lord, but if you call him Lord and you call him Jesus, then you find out if there's a Lord and Jesus. Is there any relationship? There's no relationship to those things. Neither does Jesus mean that Yahweh is salvation. If you look Jesus up in a dictionary, it means uh, uh, Jesus, the founder of the Christian religion. It doesn't give you an etymology or an uh, 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 a, 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 the name, 
description of the name, uh, the derivation of the name, etymology. It doesn't give you an etymology of that name. The etymology of Yahshua is Yahweh is salvation, you understand? And Yahweh, we read over in Proverbs, is the one who does the preparation of the heart and gives you salvation. This Bible is consistent if it's explained to you and kept together so that you can see, yes, this says this, this says this, this whole thing is, is consistent. So these law and prophets that we have are important because they will show you invisible things. Uh, uh, get me uh, uh, to the law and to the testimony. Uh, uh, Isaiah 8 and 20. Eight. Isaiah 8 and 20, please. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. <clears throat> to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So here in your scriptures, talking about knowledge of Yahweh now, we're not talking about your car mechanic, we're talking about God or spirit. Uh, uh, it says to the law and to the testimony, the law is the first five books of the Bible. I got five minutes left here. Five minutes, Karen, thank you. So I got, I'm on top of you. Thank you. <laughs> so the first five books of the Bible are the law and then the, the testimony is from Joshua the Malachi. And so to the law and to the testimony, if they, and anyone who's going to talk to you about God, if they don't use the law and the testimony, there's no light in them. And light is analogous to illumination of your understanding, which is why you can't throw the Old Testament out and you can't understand anything about the New Testament, what you call the New Testament, without knowing about the Old Testament. And I'm just going to go to my old rant about baptism because I got four minutes and I can do this in four minutes. Uh, I would need John and the Messiah and the third chapter of Matthew. And real quick, uh, John's out baptizing Jews because when, once he baptizes the right one, he will know who the Messiah is. His purpose is to point out to the Messiah through this baptism because he says, look, there's going to be someone who's going to come and baptize you after me. And his baptism is greater than mine. And his baptism is the baptism of fire and the Holy Spirit. And none of you people I'm talking about out in Christianity have felt the baptism of fire and the Holy Spirit. You got water baptism. And uh, so now get me that in Matthew uh, 3, uh, uh, Yahshua comes to John. Go ahead. 313. Then cometh Yahshua from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him saying, I have need to be baptized of thee and comest thou to me? Now, John made that statement for this reason. John's baptism is a baptism of repentance. And the Messiah is without sin, so he's got nothing to repent. Everybody else that John baptized repented some sin that they had, and he put them in water and washed those sins away symbolically. Here comes the Messiah. The, John says, have you sinned? Messiah says, no. And John says, well, if you haven't sinned, and I know I've sinned, then I have need to be baptized of you, and you're coming to me. And here's what the Messiah says to John in reply to that. Read. And Yahshua answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. He says, Look it, let's do this, do it now, because we have to fulfill all righteousness. And fulfill means finish, not institute. And the world got confused about that because they didn't want to think that Jesus was finishing righteousness or ending righteousness. Fulfill means to end. He doesn't, and, and what they don't understand is they have a concept of righteousness, which is not Yahweh's concept of righteousness. Yahweh's conscious of concept of righteousness is at the time that the Messiah says this to John is back in Deuteronomy uh, 6, 24. And it says, if you do all these works of the law of Moses, that will be your righteousness. That's the definition of righteousness. Everything that was given to Moses under that old covenant was the definition of righteousness uh, at, to, to Yahweh at that time to the whole world. And Yahweh set it up so that they re recognized that that righteousness was impossible for them to keep because it'll, you'll find out none were found righteous, no, not one. That's why every one of those Jews that came to John before the Messiah had some kind of unrighteousness. 
And in order to have a true righteousness, it can't be by works of the law because each and every one of us would fail if we had to have our righteousness dependent on what we could do because we're not perfect. We're not getting it done. We need the righteousness, which is of Yahweh, which came at Pentecost. And in Pentecost in that upper room, the, the, there was a mighty rushing wind that filled the whole room that they were in. And that represents or was the Holy Spirit, you understand. And they were immersed or baptized in that mighty rushing wind. And that's what a baptism is an immersion, not water immersion, just simply an immersion. That's why uh, John did water immersion, but he expressed that there was going to be spiritual immersion. John did water baptism. He expressed there was going to be spiritual baptism. So in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, they were immersed in the Holy Spirit and they had cloven tongues of fire on them. So they were baptized in fire and the Holy Spirit. And no longer were they ever doing any water baptism. Uh, uh, under the new covenant. Under the new covenant, water baptism was not in just spiritual baptism of fire and the Holy Spirit, but the whole world wants to put you in water. And if you go down uh, in, in Egypt down here in this chart that you see, when uh, Israel went through the divided waters of the Red Sea, listen, they did not get wet. They were not wetted with water. They were immersed in that cloud that uh, separated those. And so they were baptized in the cloud. Uh, Pharaoh was baptized in water. That water came down and that water killed them. And right. now under this uh, 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 age and dispensation, uh, if you don't get the baptism by the Holy Spirit or by a knowledge and understanding of Yahweh, if you're satisfied with H2O sprinkled on you or H2O splashed on you or you being dumped in h2o and you can call it holy water but you know you take that basin of holy water and you look at it under a microscope and you're going to see bacteria in there and every other thing stuff is not clean and that's a manifestation that the physical water won't do i appreciate the time thank you thank you very much dr emler and um that'll conclude our class I'd like to thank everyone for attending. We have uh, Ithaca class has a Zoom class every Sunday from 11 to 1. And at this time, we'll have the uh, doxology read, which is taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless in the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Elohim, our savior, through Yahshua, the Messiah, our sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let the class say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. hallelujah.